Well, good morning and welcome to Resilient and Persistent, Wisconsin SBA's 2022 National Small Business Week Winners Panel. I'm Eric Ness, the Wisconsin District Director for the U.S. Small Business Administration. This is the first time SBA has offered this panel during uh, National Small Business Week, and we are very glad to do it in collaboration with the Lieutenant Governor's Small Business Academy. Next slide. So, um, what we're, uh, what you might want to know is how are our winners chosen? So, the business owners you will meet today have received an SBA award recognizing how they have managed their business on many levels how they faced adversity, and how they have given back to their communities. So that's kind of the criteria we work, look at in awarding our Small Business Award winners. We also recognize the very important supporters of small businesses, SBA award-winning resource partners and champions, all of whom have tools to help small business in their planning and growth. Next slide. So SBA is back resource partners with, uh, uh, with 28 locations around the state, mentor and educate small business owners. You may be hearing a lot of them just this week. So I wanna go over our winners uh, in this area. So the first one is Talia Mendez. She heads up the Women's Business Center of the Year. She is the Milwaukee Project Director for Wisconsin Women's Business Initiative Corporation. She coordinates small business training and many other initiatives at WIBIC. Our next winner is Jim Anjeski, is the SCORE Mentor of the Year, and he's mentored over 41 clients last year and connecting them with our community organizations for more help. He also headed up uh, in the past uh, the SCORE chapter in the Milwaukee and South East Wisconsin. As center director, the SBDC at UW Green Bay, Tara Carr of the UW Green Bay is a recipient of the SBDC Excellent and Innovation Center Award. She has overseen several key initiatives that have expanded the SBDC's ability to serve small businesses both locally and throughout Wisconsin. Next slide, please. So for our small business champions, Teresa Carl is our minority small business champion, heads Legacy Redevelopment Corporation. With 30 years of lending experience, she has expanded its reach in Milwaukee and Racine. LRC is a CDFI and SBA Community Advantage Lender dedicated to building wealth to support small micro businesses in their poorest, racially segregated and underserved neighborhoods. Our next winner is Maria Watkins, Wisconsin's business champion, or Wisconsin's women's business champion. She founded Polaris Talent to elevate the talent acquisition process process for small businesses. She mentors and volunteers with WIBIC and other organizations supporting entrepreneurship. So let's congratulate all of our winners. Next slide. Okay, so now we get to meet uh, our small business awardees. And uh, so uh, I am going to introduce each of them and then ask them a question and then give them a chance to respond for a few minutes before we move on to the next winner's question. So I guess the screen goes live just a second. And uh, so our first winner is Chef D Dave Heidi, a small, the Small Business Wisconsin SBA Person of the Year. He owns Liliana's Restaurant and the nonprofit Little John's in Fitchburg. Pre-COVID, he quadrupled the restaurant's profit during the pandemic. He pivoted to online orders and takeout meals while bringing the restaurant and farm communities together. He also served 7,000 meals weekly 
to food insecure people to little johns. So David, are you on? There he is. So how did you get started in this business and how have you used SBA to support your business? So I'm gonna turn it over to you, Dave. Yeah, so I uh, got started in the business, named the restaurant, our first restaurant after my kiddo. Um, but I started out as a chef and went to Le Cordon Bleu, graduated top of my class there, and then worked in California at some Michelin starred restaurants and just knew that Wisconsin was still my home. It's where I grew up. Uh, came back and opened up my restaurant, Liliana's, after my firstborn kiddo. And then since then, I've opened all my businesses named after my children as well. So we had Charlie's on Main in Oregon. Little John's is after my son, and that's our nonprofit. Um, and for me, it's always been for the the reason is to make people happy. That's why I cook. I, I just like making people happy. Wow. What kind of resources have you used from the SBA? I think all of them so far. Um, we uh, we <laughs> use the EIDL, definitely. We took out 150 for the IDL. We, um, we have two entities. Um, one of them was fortunate enough to get the RRF. The other one was not lucky enough to get the RRF. So hopefully that gets um, refilled. I'm definitely helping advocate for that with Main Street Alliance. So hopefully that gets re redone. Um, and then both rounds of, um, of PPP we did. Uh, Pretty, I think pretty much every everything that you guys had available. And I will be honest, like we were fortunate, we had supporting people, but absolutely without the help from the SBA programs, I wouldn't be a restaurant owner today. Like we, we did a lot of what we did, we did through helping for the community. We kept our staff employed throughout the entirety. We didn't have any layoffs and we were able to do that because of the loans and the funds we have, hoping that like we'll get to a better day, you know, so. I am incredibly thankful for those resources. Sounds good. Thanks, Dave. Our next uh, winner or panelist we're going to introduce is Denisha Nesbitt, uh, and who is the Wisconsin SBA Emerging Small Business Person of the Year. Her company, Cover Care, is receiving, uh, in receiving matches caregivers with families through an online matchmaking system, similar to a dating website. She has guided the business to high growth and expansion since starting in 2015. She is an in-demand public speaker and she mentors business owners with the Wisconsin Women's Business Initiative. So, Deshana, how did you, how did you get started? I'm sorry. Denisha, how did you get started in this business? Um, well, it's interesting because I worked with youth and families for 15 years prior to getting prior prior to getting into the home health care industry. Um, I was graduating from college. Um, I was just coming from a huge loss of a of a previous business, which I co-owned a um, used car dealership and it did not do well at all. And so um, coming out of that and graduating from college, I said, hey, you know, I wanna do something in the service industry again. So I did my research um, and I knew a few people that were into the business. I asked them a few questions. They gave me bits and pieces of information. So I had to, you know, go all in myself. And I actually ended up um, uh, volunteering at one of the biggest, home care agencies in Milwaukee. And I worked directly under the director. It was it was amazing how it all happened. And um, I did that for six months. She knew that I wanted to do a home care agency. She walked mm -hmm. me through that process. Um, so after I left from working with her, I ended up working for another company so that I can learn how to be a caregiver. So I had never done this before. So I wanted to know how to run both sides of it, from the administrative side and from the actually the actual providing services side. So I did that for six months um, until my client passed away, and um, by that time I was ready to to get going. Wow, what kind of challenges did you face? <laughs> um, are you just referring to the upstart or just like in general? In kind of in general, what's going on? Well. Um, we really did grow really well. I started the company in 2015. 
Um, I started out doing everything myself. I was the caregiver. I was the administrator. I was the accountant. I was the toilet cleaner. I was the everything, right? And right. so um, I, I grew from doing everything myself to having um, one, one employed person um, that was working full time, actually. And it just kind of like miraculously took off from there. And what I, I think what, what made my company stand out um, from the other home care agencies in my area was that I noticed that there was, there was high turnaround in the home care industry. Um, this is prior to COVID. Um, and so what I did was I developed an algorithm which I utilized the community college uh, in Milwaukee, MATC, and they created an algorithm that uh, matched caregivers with clients according to their personality, not just from a skill set standpoint, but from the personality. And that was beneficial because sometimes you can have a person that has all the skills in the world, but their personalities don't match with the client's personality or the family's personality. And that right there set my business apart from all the other agencies. And there was, and no one else has anything like this um, in the country besides one place, one company in Santa Monica, California. Um, so that really did help us a lot with our growth. Um, but since COVID, um, we have had challenges in the, for, as far as the workforce goes. Uh, in 2020 was actually our biggest year. Like we, I would say, tripled <laughs> in in revenue in 2020. In 2020, but 2021, um, we saw we experienced a huge hit. Um, people weren't applying for jobs as much, which means that we could not take as many referrals. Um, so we're just kind of getting, you know, coming off of that. People are starting to apply again. We had to raise the um, pay, which was great, you know, because I always wanted to give more to my staff, but because um, we're we're paid by the state, so we're kind of capped at how much we can pay, you know, and still make a profit. But it's turning around, so I'm excited. Wow, small business pivots, right? So it sounds cool. Yeah. I I, li I like that the the uh, algorithm uh, and uh, the matching that you put together. That is cool. So, Thank you. Okay. Uh, our next small business that we're going to talk to is uh, Jeff House. Jeff is the president and CEO of the Oneida Total Integrated Enterprises based in Milwaukee and is Wisconsin's 8A graduate of the year. OTI is a full service engineering, science, and construction management company owned by the Oneida Nation of Wisconsin. Since graduating from the 8A Business Development Program in 2017, OTI has continued to succeed in federal marketplace with four out of five contracts awarded competitively. So hi, Jeff. Got a, got a couple of questions. Congratulations. Uh, so how did, how did OTI get started? OTI actually got started in 1988. Um, our founding um, owner actually was uh, working in the city of Milwaukee and approving environmental uh, assessment uh, contracts. And she thought, you know what, I could do this. So back then in 1988, you had to scour the newspapers and uh, she found a small contract or, or, or RFP for a um, assessment in La Crosse. And so she applied, she won it, and I guess the rest is history. So this slowly grew and grew and grew. Um, and eventually, um, they had uh, the 8A program, which really turned their business uh, into a powerhouse, if you will. Well, what's your experience with 8A? You know, how, how does somebody access it and uh, how does it work? So the 8A uh, is a really unique program in that um, it allows, it really just narrows the field of competition. A lot of people think it's an easy button. It's really more of a hunting license. So. Um, our experience has been, particularly with uh, our business uh, specialist down in Milwaukee, um, has been real powerful. You still have to do all your due diligence. You still have to do uh, quality work. You still have to do just like you would any other customer. Um, uh, but once you understand the process, and you have to understand that this is for federal government, and so they, they think a little differently when it comes to uh, awarding contracts, but it is an opportunity to um, narrow the competition field to, to other 8A companies. 
Um, and then every once in a while, when things are just right, you may even get a sole source contract, but it's pretty rare, uh, but it does happen. Wow. I think with the, with the whole infrastructure bill, it probably is a wise move to get in, especially if you're working in the federal contracting to get some of these certifications, like the 8A program, which is, is that what you're seeing? Absolutely, and so Oneida is unique. So we have a sister company called Oneida Engineering Solutions that is in the 8A program now. So we can partner with OTI and OES to go after some of these contracts, but at the end of the day, we still have to be competitive. We still have to deliver quality work. Um, again, it's, it's not an easy button, uh, but it does certainly help narrow the competition at the end of the day. Sounds good. Thank you. Yeah. Our next uh, business we're going to talk uh, with is, uh, well, actually the business owner is Teresa Peters and her husband, Rod. They own Backwood Cafe and Team in Hayward, Wisconsin. They started their business 35 years ago and now have three locations, including a kiosk on the American Burka Binder Trail. They support the Burka Binder Race and other trail activities. Uh, Teresa, uh, uh, Teresa uh, I, when I'm in Hayward, I've actually had coffee and had meetings at your location. So I know exactly where you are. Looking forward to getting up there. So how did you start this business up in Hayward? Well, thank you, Eric, for having me today. I appreciate that. Um, well, the coffee kind of started in my blood in about 1987. I was the uh, vice president of a local roastery in Hayward, Wisconsin. And so for 10 years, I, I kind of look at that time period as kind of a Harvard education into coffee. I actually learned from some of the best in the industry. And so in 1997, I had an opportunity to purchase a small local coffee shop called Backroads Cafe, which at the time was operating as a boutique coffee shop and mail order business in Hayward. Um, saw an opportunity to really wholesale in addition to the retail beverages and the mail order business. So in about two years after kind of getting involved in the retail portion of the business and really understanding that because I came from a wholesale background, um, started going door to door, knocking on different businesses that did not roast their own coffee, but uh, were purchasing roasted coffee and started developing our wholesale business. So in 1999, I started knocking on doors, and in 2001, we needed more roasting space, so we uh, built a little roastery outside of town. And uh, in 2013, we added on to that roastery about another 4,000 square feet. And uh, so today, we're in a roastery now for Midwest Roasters of about 6,000 square feet, and then we also have Backroads Coffee Shop downtown. So we've separated the two, and called our Roastery Midwest Roasters, and the shop is still Backroads Coffee and Tea. Wow. So over the last few years, or just a, what have, how are the challenges, or have you been faced any challenges up there? So uh, kind of maybe lay some of that stuff out. Yeah, actually, there have been challenges, um, especially in the beginning, especially the unknown and the uncertainty of what was going to happen. Um, so some of those challenges were just closing down the coffee shop uh, temporarily for a while and then uh, deciding that one of the things that helped save the coffee shop in the beginning is we turned one of our windows on the side of our building into a drive through coffee shop and we got permission from the city to use that window as a drive through and the neighbor that owned the parking lot adjacent our building allowed us to use that as a drive through So we turned that window in a drive, into a drive through ran that for about a month. Um, and then it, Hayward is, as you know, a tourist town. And honestly, within two weeks after the onset of COVID, you really didn't know that COVID existed. The town was so busy. There were so many people coming to the area. They have cabins here, so they decided to utilize those cabins as their living quarters during this pandemic so they could get outside and walk their trails and be tied to a home in the city. And uh, so, so the business actually um, did, did actually pretty well during that time period. And then the other thing that we did to offset some of that uh, COVID, uh, we ended up hanging a banner on the side of our building and the banner said free shipping anywhere in the continental US. And so we allowed our mail order customers to purchase coffee and we would ship it anywhere. Wow. And 
and behold, we had quite a following just in Hayward that wanted their coffee shipped to their home. <laughs> so that was interesting. I found that very interesting. And we still continue today to ship to some local uh, residents in Hayward. And then one of the other parts of the program that kind of took off is my son was in the process of redeveloping our online store and we decided to go through a different platform. So we use Shopify as our platform, which the SEO is amazing on Shopify. And within weeks, we saw over a 35% increase in traffic on our online store. And of course, it had a lot to do with people living at home and working from home and so on and so forth. But even today, we are experiencing tremendous growth with our, with our mail order business. And I, I have to give credit to the development that Josh put together on the website but as well as the platform itself. It is amazing. The SEO is amazing on Shopify. Um, and then one of the other things that we decided that we were going to do is bakery seemed to be um, a growth area in our, in our little retail store. So we decided to do a DBA Vibes Bakery. And that actually has been a huge growth for us. In fact, we're in the process right now of adding on, uh, building out our coffee shop and we will be moving our Vibes Bakery that we carved out a little footprint at our roastery for, we'll be moving that to town. So Vibes Bakery will also become our bakery, but as well catering. And uh, we have an online store for that too. Oh, wow, a lot of pivoting, a lot of changes. A lot of pivoting. Oh, it was, it was great, it was fun. But we have a team, they may not always agree, but they are the most supportive team you could possibly imagine. And they supported us through all of this. They just said, what can we do to help? And right. it was amazing. Wow. Well, great. We're going to move on to our next uh, panelist. And this person is Eric Kaufman, is the owner of the Madison-based based Graftovian makeup company and Wisconsin's Small Business Exporter of the Year. This third-generation family-owned business makes professional quality high definition makeup and body paint for theater, film, TV, fashion, and special effects. They export all over the world. The company is in the process of moving its manufacturing, I think from Brooklyn to Madison. So Eric, uh, how have you used some of the SBA resources? How does that all work? And maybe tell us a little bit about your business. Well, <laughs> Start out with where the and business turn on your camera. <laughs> What's that? If you turn on your camera, is it on? I don't see it. So I think I missed. That's fine. Go forward. Can you see me now? I think how about that? There you go. Hello there. Hi. Uh to, to start out with where the business began. Uh I was uh, 16 years old when my father uh, met with someone who bought up the remnants of the sky sticks that we had manufactured when I was an infant. Uh, we, my father had started the business. My dad's name was Grattan, and he and my my mother uh, Evie had had started this small business uh, trying to make a a, a soap based face paint but they tried to sell it to the wrong market. And so that went out of business, but oddly enough, a local costume shop uh, bought up all the old stuff 10 years later and then started asking for more. And uh, my father was hesitant because, uh, you know, he had, he had gone out of business 10 years prior and he didn't, he didn't want that heartache again, but she can, she convinced him this costume shop convinced my dad that, that there were about 600 more of her in the, in the, uh, in the nation. And uh, and he he really ought to reconsider. So she she literally took my parents down to Palatine, Illinois, and and introduced them to a small uh, area meeting of the National Costumers Association. And uh, he came home. I was 16 years old at that point. He came home and said, "Kid, we're going back into business." <laughs> and that is the beginning for me of uh, of Graftobian Makeup Company. Um, and we just made face paint for several years. But over time, uh, we added this kind of makeup and that kind of makeup and the other kind of makeup, partnered up with a guy in New York who knew how to make theatrical makeup. 
and we just we just kind of kept going and added one makeup after another after another and now graftobian manufactures just about every kind of makeup you can imagine uh, and the you know who knew that the a, a place making hollywood type makeup would uh, you know sprout up in 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 madison wisconsin but that's uh, what has ultimately transpired wow what kind of uh, SBA resources have you used in this whole growth process? Well, my dad, uh, when he built the initial building, uh, uh, I believe used SBA resources. But what I know for a fact is we, as Susan and Eric Kaufman, the next generation, uh, we've used uh, uh, the SBA for, uh, for starting our partnership with the guy in New York, number one, to buy all the equipment. That we currently have moved to Madison, so that was an SBA loan. Uh, most recently, of course, through COVID, we uh, we did uh, the PPP uh, loan twice. Uh, took advantage of that and uh, were able to keep all of our employees. We didn't lose a single one of them uh, throughout uh, all of COVID, which was hugely important to us uh, to keep those employees. Um, uh, first, they stayed home, and then they came back when we realized that a we were an essential business, uh, manufacturing products for the uh, funeral industry as well, because our makeup is used, especially our airbrush makeup, is used uh, uh, by morticians uh, to uh, cosmetize, is what they 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 term that uh, uh, that process. And so, not only that, but we we're also making hand sanitizer. So we we were an essential business, and and. Here in this building, people could be 30 or 40 feet apart from one another. They didn't have to be right near each other at all, and typically they're not anyhow. So we could give social distancing was not an issue. Uh, so SBA uh, uh, sort of bailed us out with the, the two PPP loans. And now, today, since I've brought all this stuff from New York and we've bought out my my ex business partner, and uh, you know, we needed to have a place to put that stuff that we that we had in New York, and we built this big beautiful building, uh, which you have seen, and uh, and of course, uh, you know, roughly fifty percent of of the cost of building that building is going to be a, a, a an SBA five hundred four loan. So you can see that SBA has been with us uh, my, and my parents all the way along. Uh, it's uh, you know once again the SBA is the champion of small businesses and and uh, and we are clearly a story that agrees with that. Right, and I saw that you have some current challenges uh, that you're dealing with also in trying to get that all completed. Correct. That's right. At, the, at this point in time, uh, we're still waiting for an 800 amp uh, uh, power panel that will run the entire factory building. Uh, so we are operating out of our our initial building at 510 Tasman. We've moved things aside and brought in uh, the most essential equipment into that building, and we'll manufacture there until such time as we can move everything over to the new building. But uh, since I can't snap my fingers and make this uh, this electric uh, uh, giant electric 800 amp panel appear, uh, I just have to be patient. Uh, but we. <laughs> We're making plenty of makeup. We uh, we poured five colors of uh, Glamour airbrush makeup yesterday, um, and uh, you know we're we're clipping along. So we we uh, we're not we're not stymied. We're just inconvenienced. But you know, a year from now, who'll care about that, right? <laughs> now, Eric, is it true that uh, I've heard that if you're watching Star Trek, you probably are seeing your makeup? Is that correct? Uh, Star Trek Enterprise was uh, just loaded with Graftobian makeup. Uh, uh, Bradley Look, um, uh, who's an Emmy Award winning makeup artist in Hollywood, and he's just about to retire. I think next year he gets to retire. He's been working in Hollywood for a long time. He used uh, almost our, our makeup almost exclusively uh, in Star Trek Enterprise, but several of the other Star Treks before and after Enterprise also uh, used a lot of Graftobian makeup. So sometimes it was airbrush makeup, sometimes it was water-based airbrush makeup, sometimes it was alcohol-based, kind of depended on what they needed to do. Uh, it, it's uh, trade shows out there in California, you know, we go out and, and, and present ourselves to all sorts of professional makeup artists and uh, they absolutely love our products. So it's, uh, it's kind of a neat thing, uh, kind of heady, you know, because we're here from the Midwest and they're out there and, and down in Atlanta now. And of course, uh, there's some main, there's there's some uh, production in New York too, but uh, makeup artists are everywhere. 
and if they're not working on TV and film, they're they're working on on weddings and and proms and and you know red carpet events and whatever. So it's there's there's a lot of need for for high definition makeup, and that has become the sort of the uh, the flagship portion of our line, uh, high definition makeup. So how do you do this international trade? You got this international trade award. What are you doing to grow that? How does that work? Well, the the WEDC has uh, has these uh, trade missions that they that they put together, and the first one we went to was live. We went to Japan. That was that was really neat. They they line up uh, interpreters and they they do the research for you ahead of time. They find the kinds of places that you ought to visit. They they line up transportation, so you really are very well taken care of. Uh, there are certain things you have to pay on your own, of course, but the the cost of being in the program is actually very, very small, and uh, an ordinary small business would not be able to absorb the kind of costs uh, that uh, any of the kinds of costs that that really put together a program like that. Uh, so in Japan, we did it, you know, the old-fashioned way: pressing the flesh, meeting the people, driving to them, sitting down with them, showing them makeup, et cetera, et cetera. However, along came COVID, and uh, at WEDC said, well, we're considering doing this in a virtual manner and all the research will be the same. We just, you know, everything will have to be done, you know, with, uh, with cameras. And it just so happens that my, uh, my newest son-in-law, my new son-in-law, uh, is a, uh, a, a photographer, videographer, et cetera. And he had a lot of neat equipment. So we were able to set up a two camera system, lavalier mic and uh, be very, uh, have a really nice feed and, uh, and meet with people in all these different countries, Mexico, uh, Poland, South Korea, uh, Germany. Um, I think I might be missing one, but we did uh, one, five virtuals and, and one in person. And it just really, kept things going and and COVID didn't stop us. It just simply didn't because we're able to meet all these folks anyhow. Uh, and Mexico has become the biggest of all those distributors for us. Uh, very excited, a pair of sisters down there, one operating out of Monterey, one operating out of Mexico City, and they are selling makeup like nobody's business. And it is wonderful, absolutely wonderful to have representation in Mexico, whereas for the last 20 years, virtually nothing. So really, really neat. So if you can land one great customer like that, things will start to spin in the right direction, which is what gave us the confidence to be able to build this uh, this building. Excellent, excellent. Yeah, SBA partners with WEDC with the step grants to help with those international trades. So I'm, I'm glad that it's working. It's a great story of how that all connected and how you're able to grow it locally. So thanks, thanks, Eric. Absolutely. And our our sixth uh, panelist is uh, uh, Julie McConaughey, and Julie is the founder and owner of Chrysalis Hair and Body in Madison. She is our SBA District Director Award winner. She started Chrysalis in 2013 to create a salon experience without harmful chemicals after she began to suffer from industry-related allergies. They especially enjoy working with people working through lifestyle and gender transitions. During the pandemic, she created an outdoor pop-up market for other artists and moved some of her retail goods into a trailer to make uh, shopping easier. So, Julia, Tell us a little bit about this. It's, I, it's very interesting. I, I like hearing your story. It seems like you've got a lot of things going on. So kind of let us know what's going on. And you're um, in Madison, right? You're in Madison. Yeah, I am in Madison. Um, basically, that's kind of the story of my life is <laughs> doing a wide variety of things. And um, the it's just made the most sense to participate in the things that have presented themselves to me throughout my life. So, um, I mean, I guess that's kind of a broad question what you were just asking me, um, but if like there's a lot of information that I could share and I want to be respectful of all of the time, but um, is there anything like kind of specific you'd like me to highlight about it? Well, how did you get the idea? And of course, I understand uh, kind of where you are, you know, 
you saw a need and you and you got into that need to kind of help your clients i mean how was that received uh, great i mean that's just that again that's like seeing a need I, i'm a very like perceptive human being so um i am oftentimes like recognizing that or instinctively i can kind of tell that someone is coming across in a little bit of a needy way um so my space it works out uh, most hairstylists uh, if they operate as a solo stylist they are have a small space usually um like a small amount of square feet maybe i don't know 100 to 200 square feet would be a thing so <clears throat> i uh started out in a space that size um originally because I didn't start out with any capital. <laughs> I started out with some scissors and some skills and some people that were wanting me to like, please still offer those skills to them um, after I couldn't be in a regular salon environment, right? So that was like me kind of addressing those needs at a fundamental level. But then as I started to experience um, being in this industry, like as my own business owner, which was amazing, um, I just felt like uh, I could finally be the yes person that I am, like in my every cell of my body. <laughs> so, I mean, I even have like on my glasses, yes, you can. Um, <laughs> so I, um, as I mean, a lot of people are talking about the COVID situation right now. How, how did that, you know, so as you're talking, like my setup that works great for me as a human being and like how my brain works and how my people enjoy coming here and how my clientele like, still feels fed by coming here. Um, it fit, oh, it rode the waves of COVID pretty well. So I'm in a one-on-one -on -one space. So my clients were coming in one on one, and everyone masks up. We just do it. We still we still mask up. I'm here alone right now, so I don't need to be wearing a mask. But we still even now are wearing them, and um, so I have a larger space now. It's more like 700, almost 800 square feet. So when I moved over here, I wasn't quite sure what that was going to fill in with that, but I can be flexible because mainly people were here for hair services. Mm -hmm. So throughout COVID, like I've always had some snacks and some hospitality items here for people to help themselves. So I beefed that up a little bit. And for clients, like there's no charge to grab some snacks and something to put in your belly. And um, I have, you're seeing behind me like mm, one sixth of my space. <laughs> All the rest of it is in front of me. And I have, I beefed up my clothing inventory, resale style. I have all sorts of things. So while people are here, it became more of a one-stop place where in COVID, people did not really want to be bopping around a whole bunch of places. Like they felt safe coming to me in my environment here because they knew I respected their health and my own. And I have got a kiddo and I want to make sure to keep my kiddo safe. Um, and so, it was just a win-win. That's kind of my ultimate phrase for everything. Like, I don't really wanna, things need to be a win-win. Otherwise, I'm not really gonna invest time and energy in it. But I do think that pretty much everything can be a win-win if the expectations get adjusted on one side or the other a little bit. I think it's possible to have balance. Wow. So keeping that balance over the waves was just kind of like, how I function. I'm kind of a steering person and I do tend to look further ahead. Um, I don't look at the short term like this. I, I take like the drone view, I like to say. And sometimes I'll lift up and be like, all right, so if these these pathways are there, what could possibly be at the end of those roads? And sometimes the the most effective pathway is not the bird the bee line. It's like or the bird's flight. It's it's actually going a little this way, which seems off path, but then around the corner there, there's gonna be maybe some assistance or something right. that curves back to the goal destination. So uh, really it's like a visceral experience for me to run my business, like in my body. Like I I just go with my gut. I mean, that's the most you know, widely used phrase. Right. To, to to talk about that. So that's what I did during COVID. I'm like, what would I want as a mom of a five and a half year old? <laughs> how, how did that pop-up market thing come up? How did you come up with that idea? Uh, because we just do fun, awesome things around here. Um, fortunately, the piece of property that my business is on, I don't own the building, but the owner here is Apollo Marcus and he's just a really sane and supportive human being. Um, and so, 
basically he trusts me. He tr I, I don't need to ask permission. I know the rules and parameters for things going on. I will look up permissions. I'll look up my own permit things. You know, if there's anything he needs to chime in on, he will, but I don't rely on him. I don't rely on another person to give me permission to be successful in what's happening here, which is like a really, really good feeling. Um, and so basically outside, we have a parking lot area that's behind the building. So even though Sherman Avenue is a busy street, we have this back area which feels really protected so people could bring their kiddos around. Like I thought, you know what? Even like so many people, you can never know how much resource a person has. They can show up in a three piece suit or they can show up in some like expensive clothing and be all put together and have really nothing, have not eaten in a couple of days. People can also show up looking like they just like rolled out of a, I don't know, van somewhere, <laughs> a tour van, a van tour van, and have a lot of resources. Right. So you don't really know. And so during COVID, uh, people were feeling really sensitive. And so I thought, you know what, I'm just going to order some extra food and have it outside. People can just help themselves or with the kids being here. You know, some parents were doing a lot of stuff on their own. So it's it was more than just having local vendors be able to sell their tchotchkes. Like, it's not really about that. It's about creating a space outside, because right. I had this outside resource of some paved area that I could freely use and with respect. And it just grew. And so they're actually about to start again. And so this year they're starting on May 15th so that the weather's hopefully kind of decent. And um, we're putting all of our uh resources kind of on the same day on sundays so like sundays 10 to 2 we're gonna have kids music we're gonna have our pop-up market going on out there it's gonna be during a time when there's a neighboring farmer's market happening that's gonna be really exciting and um like you know sunday morning or just mornings in wisconsin can be some of the most gorgeous times right so it's like why not right there's just so many great things about it we just want to keep scooping all that in it. And I want to, I want to ride those waves. Right. So what, um, what SBA uh, resources have you used? Well, um, I have never ever taken out a loan for Chrysalis and I didn't start with any capital either. I started with my skills and people encouraging me to do it because they, they wanted to come. So, um, I was, I've always been leery about doing that because I don't want to overcommit. Right. As a young financing person, as a young adult, uh, we, you know, I did not have a lot of information about how credit worked. And so I worked super hard to pay off a lot of personal random debt. And like I'm a, I decided I'm not doing that again. So um, when the PPP program was advertised, I mean, I'm at the time I was the only like employee because I'm a solo entrepreneur. So I did submit for the PPP loans because they were. Uh, uh, forgivable right and so that that made me feel okay about taking that out and as a small business person at that time you know it was a really small amount but at least it was something and then um i was starting to think more about my kiddo myself and how i support everything like i don't have anyone else paying my way and so um i thought if i did get sick or if i did if there was another stay at home, I didn't know for sure if there would be any sort of support, like just given, because you know, there were some grants given to everyone, but it was like small amount. So um, I thought I should probably have some, a little bit of cushion at this point. And if it means I have to borrow it via the EIDL loan, then I'm just going to accept that, um, you know, I would need to pay interest on it, which, can seem like a lot when you calculate the whole thing, but in the grand scheme of business, I do think it's a good idea business-wise how the EIDL loans are, like um, how they are arranged. Right. Because um, the the supportive entity needs to get paid back. Right. right? So it's, it's a thing, interest exists for a reason. Right. So I did go ahead and take a small portion of what the allotment would have been for me for the EIDL. And um, I put it in basically, you know, I put it in my savings account for Chrysalis and um, I wasn't intending to hang on to it forever, but I, then things started to feel better. Vaccinations were coming, you know, there was like some more feeling and my clients 
we're really feeling safe here. And I've had over a thousand clients in my chair since uh, we started back up. We are 12 inches from each other's faces for at least an hour. I mean, I'm not wearing a shield, you know what I mean? I'm like masks, hand washing, and I still have not gotten COVID. Wow. So people were feeling safer. And I, I love that. That's what I want. So anyways, through the EIDL, I thought, okay, I'm not, I, I, everything needs to stay moving in my world. So I thought, okay, well, maybe it's time for me to hire an employee. You know, wow. so I went ahead and I did that. And I basically wanted to start making the shop portion of my space, bringing in some of its own revenue because, without me doing the hair in case I did get sick. Or in case, you know, because if I, just like Donisha, like she was talking about how she did all the things. Right. Well, I did all the things. And so if I am shut down for being ill or my kid or something like that, like I didn't want Chrysalis to just pause because essentially at that time, Chrysalis was just me. But now Chrysalis isn't just me. I mean, I'm like the Chrysalis parent over here, but right. I have three employees now who, Wow. One of them has their own kid. One of them supports a partner. Another person, um, actually another person had a little kid and now they're actually bounced from here. And they're like, Julia's doing her own business. I should totally take my thing and do my business. And I'm like, yeah, see ya. I mean, I wanted her, she's doing it. It's awesome. So that like, she doesn't work hours here anymore because she has started and really is beefing up her own business effort because she saw that it could be done. You know, so that's that's like how I use the SBA funds. And um, like the second time around, it was like, you know, you were asked about challenges. <laughs> the challenge for me is that I earn all the dollars for this whole business historically, right? With these suckers right here. And right. so um, when the second round of the PPP happened, you know, I already had my ducks in a row. I was ready, had my documents ready, and I was stoked about that. And so I submitted and I got my same amount of um, money percentage as from before, which was a percentage of our net income. Well, as a sole entrepreneur, like we generate monies that don't become our income. Right. And so when we can't be open, we can't bring in any of that overhead money. Right. So, you know, shortly after the um, first PPP, the second PPP allotment came out, there was a change where some of the small businesses or, who hadn't yet gotten it could right. actually use their gross amount. Yeah. And so that was a, that that was a challenge. You know, I mean, of course, not to be uh, unappreciative of the right. initial program, right? But that was a tricky challenge. So I was like, mm, well, I'm glad that I went ahead and did you know, like arrange an amount of the EID alone to be there for me. So like okay. it, there's an attitude of teamwork. It has to be a win-win. You know, we okay. could all complain about how much we didn't get or which we did get and all these things. But in the end, it's like, are we still awake? Are we eating breakfast? Are we going, right. are we still trying? Because obstacles are gonna come up whether it's something someone's giving us or not. Right. And so teamwork, right? Yep, thanks Julia. We're gonna we're gonna run through it again, but we're gonna kind of get uh, people's uh, uh, recommendation for businesses going forward. I guess Julia, uh, we'll start with you. What would you recommend for a person? You've got people that are starting business. Kind of a short recommendation of what they should do to get their business going or start their business. From zero, from like a seed, from an from idea. Zero. Yeah. Um. Well, I have always been of the mindset that if there's something that you love to do, like Eric, say you make the best PB&J in the universe. Like you're like, everyone's always coming over and ask me to make peanut butter and jelly sandwiches. I don't know, it's a sandwich, right? That is something that you enjoy doing. It's easy for you to do because you don't have to add a whole bunch of extra into your world. And I always, my philosophy is if you spent 40 hours a week trying to earn money making peanut butter and jelly sandwiches, you totally could because you just have to put the time in. You just have to show up with a skill that you innately have. That's so if it's something that like is easy for a person to do, like for me, I was always like, I was always ponytail, sweatshirt, jeans, sneakers. Like 
straightforward, nothing fancy. But when I was in grade school, even high school, I was like doing all my friends' hair randomly for like the prom and stuff, which I didn't even go to. Right. You know, I was like helping them pick stuff out. I enjoyed doing those things, but I personally was just like a very plain individual visually. Um, and so eventually that evolved a bit, but okay. I never thought of being a hairstylist because I thought it wasn't something that was like a real job. Yeah. But I'm fully supporting myself and my kid from like starting out French braiding my middle school friend's hair. Very so good. it, you know, no one else would have told me to be a hairstylist. Right. It just occurred to me as a natural skill. And then the rest of the things about me, like being able to converse with people, relate to people, all those things. It In the end, it doesn't end up being about the one skill. It's just the work part should be fairly straightforward for you and okay. then you can be at ease enough to add to it with a personal touch and that's what small business is about is about the person the owner and what they can give you not what they can just delegate thank you julia hey eric what what if you had a, a small piece of advice to give somebody who what would it be well for starters i guess when people come to me with a with an idea sometimes i go to a trade show and somebody will come to me with an idea and as they're talking about their own idea the thing that seemed to be the gem in their pocket um that you can hear sometimes they 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 start to lose lose the confidence that they are the right person to take on that idea and move it forward and I then try to say, listen, your idea is a good idea. You've got you've got something there. Don't give away your best idea. Go ahead and follow through with it. It's your thing. And you know, I've had this happen a couple of times. Uh, I don't know, you know, why they come to me other than the fact that I'm a business owner. But they, they start talking about this, that, and the other thing. And I, you know, but I've, I've said this to more than one person. Don't give away your best idea just do it you know you, you come up with a, a widget that's the coolest thing that, that that anybody's ever seen or you've ever seen or ever thought about don't just hand it to somebody else and say hey you ought to do this <laughs> well how about you get behind it and do it yourself now once you have the confidence to do it yourself then you got to go through the steps to to make it happen to make it actually happen and right. those steps you know they can be myriad and you learn how to make task lists long task lists and check things off and prioritize them and you just you just have to as a business owner you just have to be able to go boom 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 and just keep up with stuff but i tell them the same thing that i've told my kids which is uh, some people say the devil's in the details no success is in the details if you can manage the details you will have success it's it, that's where it is, and and it if you can stay organized, right, we'll have success. Sounds so good, Eric. That's what I say. Thank you, Teresa. How about you from up in Hayward? What's your uh, recommendation for businesses going forward? Well, most of the time, if somebody has an idea about starting a business, uh, typically they're they're pretty passionate about that idea, and we all know where passion can take us. And passion can take us riding over these waves like they did it for COVID for all of our businesses. And I guess what I would recommend going forward is for them to take that passion, that idea, and they want to transform it into a business that once they get to that point, I would suggest that they form a really good relationship with a really good banker, a great accountant, possibly an attorney, and discuss a lot of those details that may be outside of their wheelhouse and use that professional advice going forward to help develop a business plan and uh, know that there is going to be risk, but with all of that risk, there's reward. And the road is never smooth, it is never easy, but if you're passionate enough about it, you'll continue. So that's the advice I have. It's hard work, but it's <laughs> worth it. That's good, thank you. Jeff, how about uh, from uh, Green Bay, what's your thoughts? Uh, I would also add to uh, find a mentor, um, either a peer group or uh, maybe not even somebody in your industry. 
to bounce ideas off uh, somebody you can uh, trust. It's lonely at the top. Um, you're going to have some questions about where you should go, what you should do. Um, it's, it's great to have someone to bounce those ideas off of. And you may get some um, unfiltered advice that, that could be really helpful. Good. Tanisha, we're turning it over to you. What's some advice you have for small businesses? There you are. I think you're, I think you're right. muted. There we there go. You. I unmuted myself. Um, well, I would say, you know, as we're talking about the theme, um, uh, resilience and persistence right you have to be resilient in running a business because you're gonna have things that's gonna happen in your life not just within your business but in your life you know your kid might get sick your parent might die you know you may get a divorce whatever the it is you're gonna experience something in your life and you have to be able to navigate through those things and still maintain your business and still show up and be present for your business. Um, and, and I would also say to, um, to other business owners or future business owners is that it's okay that when you're running this marathon of, of being a business owner to take a break. To, to, to go to the sideline and have that drink of water, to wipe the sweat off your face, to catch your breath for a second, you know? Because this, the world makes us believe that we have to just keep going, 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 like we're machines. We're not machines, we're human, you know? You have to take time to say, you know what? Let me smell these roses because they're looking kind of pretty over here and I'm moving so fast that I forgot what a rare rose even looked like or smell like, you know? Take the time to smell the roses because just being busy, 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 you know, you miss the small moments of, of the successes that you have accomplished. You know, the people that you have inspired, you have people that's watching you that you like, like Julia said, you know, she has someone that started their own business because of her, because of them being inspired by her. You know, you have people that's watching you. So you don't want to teach them by default how to just keep going, 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 and they don't see you actually enjoying your success. So right. take the time to smell the roses. Thanks, Anisha. And Chef Dave, close this out. So give us some advice. Uh, okay, I've got four things, but I promise they will be quick and it won't be a 40 minutes of, of things. So the <laughs> biggest one for me was that the reason I became an entrepreneur and the reason I started my own business is because I am a horrible employee. I am a god awful employee. None of you should ever hire me if my restaurants don't work out because I just think that my ideas are great and I want to do them and people who conflict with them are tough. But the problem is is that as a small business owner, there's nobody holding me accountable. There's no one that's mm -hmm. telling me when things need to be done by. There's no one holding me to deadlines. I'm the one in charge and although that sounds great, it is the number one way to let your business fail is because there's no one checking in on you. So my First advice is set up your own accountability, hold yourself accountable, hold yourself to deadlines. It's one of the most important things with business. Um, the second one, it'd be if you have a passion project or something you're excited about, decide if that means you want it to be your business in your life because there's no getting out of it afterwards. And something that could have started off as a passion or something you're in love with can easily turn into something you no, wonder, no longer wanna look at or touch or think about anymore. And with that same note, just make sure that it is actually a business that you can create from it. So do take the time, make the business plan, figure out how you can turn that hobby into a passion. Uh, the third thing is um, my wife always makes fun of me because literally every time she asks, hey, when do you want to go do this? When do you want to do that? When do you want to do anything? My answer is always next week looks great because <laughs> my week fills up every single week and i never have time in the moment i never have time to do those things and it's always like but next week you know i look at my calendar right now it's up on my computer it's free looking i'm like this is great i'll have all the time i can get the projects done i can spend time with the kids like i can do anything i want and sure enough by monday my executive assistant will have that sucker filled up tight and then i'm like oh but next week will be okay so make time just like you were saying before make time for you make time for your family because at the end of the day if you retire at 60 years old with a million dollars in your bank account and you've missed your kids growing up and you've yeah. missed like being with your wife and you've missed being with your partner, 
that's the um, that what was the point and my final thing is this this was a piece of advice i got from my architect um the day i opened up my restaurant his name's matt arrow and he's actually helping me with the redesign of my new restaurant um and it wasn't really advice so much as of like a, a proverb i guess and he said being a small business owner is incredible he said you will have the highest highs you've ever had in your entire life higher than you ever could have working for someone else followed four hours later by the absolute lowest low you can ever have in your entire life and i think that this pandemic has been absolute proof of that just sort of like yeah numbers are good like i can get my catering business back together again we're good it's like oh yeah what about omicron what you got i'll close that down you know like and it was literally like throughout the entire pandemic, some of the best news in the world, like, don't worry, there's the RRF. And we're like, thank God, it's a restaurant that'll save us. And it's like, oh, JK, only half you guys get it. You know, and it's like, oh, OK, cool, cool, cool. And then it was like, you know, uh, events can happen again and we can take our mask off. And then it was like, oh, just kidding. So my advice is this, follow what your heart is, but follow it with a clear and open mind because just following with your passion is like the number one way to fail you have to back the passion up with the fact that what you're doing is work and you have to have a plan behind it and i think especially with restaurants you can see that all the time where someone's like you do make a great peanut butter and jelly sandwich you should open up a peanut butter and jelly restaurant and although that's really cute and it's really fun make sure you can vet how you're gonna actually gonna profit from it and love it every day because i work 90 hours a week and i love every damn hour of it so for me it's not work that's all I got. Thanks. Thanks to all. Congratulations to our winners. And hit the next slide. We want to thank WEDC for uh, this partnership. And I know you all have sessions to go to, but you see our resource partners. If you're looking at uh, possible winners for next year, uh, think about it and let us know. And I am done. So thanks all. Thanks, winners. You're thank wonderful. Thank you, everybody. Bye, right. right, you guys. Good to see you on virtual yeah. person. And congratulations, everybody. You too. Congratulations. Take care. <laughs>